Welcome to Manifold. My guest today is T.P. Huang. You may remember that I had him on the show about a month ago, and he gave us an, a really excellent introduction to what is happening in the U.S.-China chip war. Now, T.P. is a real expert on the frontier of technologies across several areas. Today, we're going to talk about electric vehicles. And if you follow him on Twitter, you'll know that he is one of the best sources tracking developments in EV markets, not just in China, but around the world. And he also follows a lot of the really hardcore technical developments, which a little bit, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit today. So TP, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Steve. Yeah, really a treat to have you back again. There was really intense interest in our last episode, partially, I think, because of your obvious expertise, and then obviously partially because the chip war is really in the news a lot. As far as electric vehicles go, it's not something that I know much about. I'm not really a car guy. I'm still driving my 2007 Honda Fit internal combustion engine car. <laughs> right. Um, and despite it being really old, it only has, I think, about 80,000 miles on it. But EVs kind of got into my onto my radar a little bit slowly, but because A, number one, a lot of Silicon Valley dudes that I interact with drive Teslas. And I, out of my peripheral vision online, I started noticing that the Chinese are getting really good at making electric vehicles and maybe even have kind of completely dominated the battery part of that industry. And actually, that might be how I know about UTP, because I might have actually like noticed your tweets uh, on this subject. So maybe just say a little bit about how you got interested in electric vehicles. Yeah, so my story is that I've always, you know, being more of like a culturally liberal person, I've always been more interested in the entire area of climate change and, you know, energy transition than a lot of people. And from about 2008, that's when I first started noticing this company called BOID. And they were at the time already introducing uh, dual motors, so like plug-in hybrid at the time, and then eventually electric vehicles. And obviously Musk was also doing, starting Tesla at that, around that time too. And I would say that for about seven or eight years there, things kind of just really progressed very slowly. And I kind of lost interest partially, but, you know, I still focused on it. And, and then later on when EV itself became more affordable, that's when I got my Tesla and, and I found that BYD itself was also doing really spend, splendidly. So I decided that this is one of those just really interesting topics that I need to get into uh, with respect to energy transition. So I've been kind of spending a lot of time in the past couple of years, just researching on this because. China itself is the, where the frontier of EV development is happening right now. So I find that a lot of the Western sources, because they're not going to China to actually see this, they're not really getting the full picture of it. So there's a lot of interest in where the development is actually going that the mainstream media is not really covering. And I think that it's a real shame that this is that it's not being covered more because this will have a immense effect in our, our lives. I was thinking that you know, when we, when, we think, when we think about automotive industry, it's basically the largest manufacturing industry in the world. A lot of the economies, their manufacturing sector is dependent on automo automobiles, right? So, you know, we can think about chips as this really important technology, but for a lot of countries around the world, having a, a car industry is actually the most important thing that they can have. Yeah, you're making an important point, which is that the automobile industry, even though, you know, you until recently, people didn't think about it as an exciting part of technology, it is really one of the dominant components of any country's manufacturing supply chain. So you, you can't be a leading manufacturing country unless you have a strong presence in the automobile industry. So in terms of like the future development of China, it was, I think, eventually important that they, that they somehow crack that market. And in a way, they were very strategic because they said, when it comes to internal combustion engines, it would be very tough for us to fully catch up with the Japanese and the Americans and the Europeans. 
And so they invested heavily in this different kind of car and things have kind of worked out in their favor, I guess, more, more than I had really originally expected. Yeah, it's kind of really took off so fast in the past couple of years. I think there's been some, one thing that I, that I tweeted recently, and I think it's kind of shocking is just the export numbers coming out of China on cars. So based on my, based on the data we've seen, so 2019 was the last year before COVID. And in September of 2019, China exported 110,000 cars in total. And this year in September, they exported almost 500,000. So that's almost a fivefold, a four, four to fivefold increase over in the space of four years. So it kind of just shows you how fast things changed in the past four years. And I don't think anyone in the Chinese government expected it to happen this quickly. Now, just to clarify that. So I believe, is China currently the number one exporter of cars right now? It is the number one exporter of cars and obviously the number one exporter of EVs and also trucks and buses, I think. Right. So I think a lot of Americans, especially like, you know, when, when I have these conversations, there's obviously a whole spectrum of people that I deal with. And there's always this spectrum of people that are, I think, a little bit behind the time. So they still think Chinese products are low quality and they're just copying Western technology, et cetera. And so they're often surprised to learn, for example, number one, that the most competitive automobile market in the world, bar none, is the Chinese market. It's also the largest and fastest growing. And as you just pointed out, that the Chinese companies themselves now are competitive in that market and are now exporting huge numbers of cars outside of China. Yeah. I think keeping in mind that a lot of these exports are from probably foreign companies that are making the cars in China and rely on the Chinese supply chain. So it's not just the Chinese automakers themselves, but you know, even with that, you can see just trend of where things are heading in terms of the exports and such. Right. Now, before Tesla built its gigafactory near Shanghai, my understanding was a foreign entity that wanted to be making cars in China had to basically enter a kind of joint venture deal with a Chinese company. That was a, the, the legal requirement. But, and so that, as you point out, like all the major manufacturers that make cars in China, like GM and Volkswagen, they are involved in a joint venture situation with a Chinese company. But Tesla was granted some kind of special deal where they could wholly own their gigafactory in Shanghai. Maybe you could say a little bit about that. Yeah, I think so. This is the part re probably related to the trade war between China and U.S. started under Trump. And part one of the things that Chinese government did agree to is that, you know, foreign automakers can come to China, have 100% ownership of the plants that they operate. So Tesla was definitely the first one to take advantage of that. And since then, I would say some of the other Western automakers have bought more of their JVs, so joint ventures from the, their Chinese partners also. Right. Now, in the Chinese market right now, there's a kind of apocalypse happening for internal combustion cars, partially because the government, which has been supporting electric vehicles by building up the infrastructure and also having you know preferential treatment of electric vehicles, i.e. in terms of registrations in cities, and I think maybe the way they can, the way that, you know, access to the roads and things like that during rush hour. Tell the listeners what, what's happening in the Chinese auto market right now. Yeah. So I think, so there was a two or three years of, during COVID time where people didn't get to go to China. So they didn't really see what was going on in the Chinese market. And the one thing that we noticed is that after Tesla came, so the one major driver for the Chinese EV market was actually not even the Chinese government, but, but Tesla actually, because when Tesla came, people in China start viewing EVs, or they call it NEVs, like new energy vehicles, which count both the battery electric and also the plug-in hybrid EVs. They started to uh, see both of these things as, I guess, more desirable, higher value, more more attractive. And because of this, this, this Tesla brought this uh, new sense of awareness and desire for EVs. Then the local manufacturers like uh, BYD, NIO, and Xbun and Li Auto, they start doing better also. And over time, you start seeing 
every tech company in China wanting to get into the EV space. And then that has added to a lot of the competition. So all the research right now in China are devoted to improving EVs and smart car features. So what happened is over by the time of this April, when we had the Shanghai Motor Show, when people went there, they saw that all the exciting cars on display were EVs. And then the entire automotive industry, especially the Germans, they realized, oh shit, we're behind. We need to catch up. And the Chinese customers noticed that all the cool stuff were locally built EVs. I mean, Tesla didn't show up at this, the Shanghai Motor Show. And there was all sort of really, really advanced looking cars in this display. So, so then the, this entire market really changed around April. And I mean, it was already shifting like very progressively to maybe like 30% NEV penetration. But since April, you started seeing that people just started not want internal combustion engine cars anymore. And recently, I think in the most recent week, we're, we're at, well, we just surpassed 40% penetration for NEVs. But even more importantly than that is that just what's happening to the internal combustion engine market, because a lot of the legacy automakers are losing money just trying to unload inventory. So the local dealers are closing and they're trying to just selling things at 30% for 30 cheaper than what they used to sell them to just unload it. So the expectation is once we get to next year and maybe the year after, we're going to see just NEVs getting to like maybe 60, 70% of the local market. And we'll, 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 see, we'll, we'll see what happens to the legacy automakers and the countries that they're from once, once this happens, because China is the largest market for all the German automakers. And it is, you know, a huge market for, for Japan and all the Japanese automakers. So if they're forced to not make any more money and probably take losses in China, what does that do to their, you know, overall situation? That's, that's a big question right now. Yeah. So I just want to emphasize again, what you just said to the listeners already the EV percentage of new car sales in China is like 40%. And that is in an environment where the internal combustion cars are having their prices slashed because the dealers want to, you know, see the handwriting on the wall and they're just trying to get rid of their inventory. So you would expect in another year that percentage to go even higher. Like I think you just said 60% or more. So you've got a market that's really passing through a tipping point very fast, like just over a period of a couple of years, it's passing through a tipping point. And because the Chinese auto market is the biggest in the world, and it's definitely the fastest growing auto market in the world, all the main manufacturers that people are familiar with, like Volkswagen and GM and Toyota, they are very dependent on that market for revenues. So some you know analyst who does a kind of macro analysis of you know, Western automakers, they need to take this into account in their projections for where the earnings and revenues of those companies are going to be in a year or two. Yes. And I think, you know, even if we look a little bit further than that, it's just the entire idea of what's going to happen with the uh, hydrocarbon industry when, you know, when this, when this kind of growth is happening in the EV industry, right? So there's, there's obviously talks already of gasoline peaking in China around 2024. Right. Maybe I think diesel, it, diesel peaking 2025. Like, or, yeah. Yeah. I think the official government projections, which in China, you know, despite what a lot of Westerners think, they're pretty serious when they make these projections. They're projecting peak gasoline consumption in China within, you know, the next year or two. It's, it's also based on my personal calculation that the gasoline itself will happen faster than the government regular projection because. Honestly, the governments are way too slow on this. The, the consumers have already left with, you know, chosen with their pockets, pocketbooks. And that's going to have a, you know, obviously a huge effect in the oil demand in, in the future. So can we, I think we've already, I, I think the, the, the important facts you've already shared with us have probably already whetted the appetite of the listeners. So they probably realize this is an important topic, that things are changing very fast. This is a super important industry for the economies of you know, all major countries. But I wanted to just take a step back and have you paint a picture for what it's like for the average Chinese person who's buying a car. 
you know, when they're looking at an electric car, is the price comparable to the ICE, the internal combustion engine car they're looking at? What are, the, what are their considerations in terms of the range, the convenience of driving the car, recharging it? I think that's so foreign to American because an American, like either you're a Tesla diehard fan or you have no idea what it's like to own a fully electric car because, and you have no idea how you would recharge it if you went on a road trip or something like that. So maybe just talk about what the world looks like to a driver in China who's trying to decide what to buy for their next car. Yeah, so I, I have some stats in front of me right now, which is kind of interesting. I think it paints a, a picture. So this is current market penetration of new sales for battery electric, so pure electric vehicles, doesn't count the plug-in hybrid. For under 100,000 in September, it was 33% battery electric. For 100 to 200,000, it was 20%. For 200 to 300, it was 33.5%. Hey, can I interrupt you for one second? So I think those prices are RMB, right? So, so it's for RMB, Ameri yes. So Americans divide by about seven, right? Or right. Seven five. So under 100K, that's a pretty cheap car, right? That's a $15,000, $16,000 car. You can't even buy a new car in America for that, I don't think. No, I mean, I think, yeah. So th I think the point I was trying to just get to is just that people are actually transitioning to new electric vehicles faster on the sh on the cheaper end because they made the so there's so there's two factors here there's the the plug-in hybrid and there's also the battery electric so the, what we saw what we've seen is the battery electric has really taken over the the sub 80,000 RMB range because the cost of electricity in China is so cheap that if you can get a a battery electric car for really cheap then you're basically you know you're basically driving free for most of the year and there's 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 no gas cost to worry about, and the infrastructure is already built for to take care of oh. electric vehicles. Can I interrupt you there? So, electricity cost in China is kind of on average. Is it like a third or a fourth of the U.S. cost? Fair. I, I you know I haven't sorry I I haven't actually looked into that, but I think it's cheaper than than the United States. I'm not 100 percent sure. The I'm reason sure. I the reason I saw the one third to one fourth numbers was is actually in a different context when people are comparing the use of AI chips. Uh, they're saying that the, the data centers in China pay a much lower price for electricity to run those chips. And I, I think I saw the number was one third or one fourth the US. So anyway, it's, it's much cheaper. Now, the people who are buying these inexpensive all electric cars in China, are they just plugging them in in their garage? How, how are they, like, what is their daily life like with this car? I think there's just a lot of areas where you can charge your car into just, you know, not supercharger, just, just regular plug-ins into the, you know, the at home kind of uh, chargers. And most of the cheap lower end cars, they charge so slow that you don't really want to plug them into like 150 k kilowatt um, charger anyways. Okay, so the so, owner the owner would have a car that has a range of we again we can't use kilometers. Well, maybe with my audience we can use kilometers, but like maybe yes. maybe three hundred kilometer range. And so when they plug it into if, if they need to fully charge it from zero, this how many hours does that take? Yeah, so I think what what typically happens is you get a car a mini car that has maybe three hundred to four hundred kilometer range, but in real world it's probably three hundred, and then you charge it overnight. So you drive in the day, you come back, and if it gets below a certain point, then you charge it maybe seven or eight hours. Maybe like normally you can probably fill it up in maybe five or six hours overnight. And then next day you come and you just drive out again. It doesn't, you don't have to wait or anything like that. So there's, so there's a battery electric. There's also the plug-in hybrid. Normally those have maybe a hundred kilometers of like pure electric, electric range. So during most days, that's enough for you to never use the actual gap, the combustion component of it. And you just charge it every night and charge it full every night, close to full every night. And that's enough for you to drive to work, pick up your kids and come back. So net net for a Chinese consumer, it's really not a big hassle for them to switch even all the way to like fully EV. Sure. And of course you, you really do have to build, have enough chargers around uh, in your buildings and parking lots and things like that for people to live hassle-free with EVs. And 
is is there a distinction between like if you're in a tier one, tier two, tier three city or rural place in China for the availability of the that charging infrastructure? You know, it's it's quite common. It's like, obviously it's very very abundant in the big cities in China, but I think it's actually also getting quite abundant in the smaller cities because you see that the sales numbers for like the third, fourth, fifth tier cities also, you know, going up quite a bit. And also people also use EVs themselves as ways of supplying electricity, feeding electricity back into the system at different point of the day. Yeah, actually at the end of the podcast, I would like to talk to you a little bit about like how the a smart grid with attached battery storage, you know, will be very revolutionary for just general energy considerations for, uh, aside from cars, but we can talk about that at the end of the podcast. But so your projection is, you know, within a year or a few years, the majority of new cars sold in China will be, I guess, fully EV. And so I think, so I think like plug-in hybrid will actually be a, a mainstay in the Chinese market until for the next four or five years, at least. That's my opinion on this. Okay. Because for most people, especially especially if you are getting to the higher end market, so, you know, for like 50,000 US dollar or higher market, you know, people are driving these for longer trips away from home. And what we, you know, there's a lot of off-road new energy vehicles coming on the market and people just aren't comfortable with the idea of having a pure electric car. Uh, Cause even the high end, they're saying that we have 700 or 750 kilometer range, but in reality, you might only get 600 kilometers out of them. And sometimes you, you need more than that when you're going far away from home on these long weekend trips and coming back. So a lot of people are preferring to go with plug-in hybrid for this kind of stuff. And so there, so I think there's going to be a market for that for quite a few years, but in overall, I would expect entire combustion engine cars to basically disappear from the sub 300,000 RMB market. So sub $40,000 market in the next three or four years. Right. So that's a, that's a huge kind of seismic shift for non-Chinese automakers and even some Chinese automakers, obviously. And do you think that there are any other than Tesla, do you think there are any non-Chinese automakers that will have significant growing market share in this new reality? Yeah. So, so that's actually, there's two, two parts of that question. One, I think Tesla is in trouble in China. That's just one. Two, I think it really depends on how hard some of these Western automakers lean on Chinese partners. So. We just saw this past week was Solantis is actually taking a 20% ownership in uh, Leap Motors. So there's, there's my projections over the, by the end of this year, or maybe over the first few months of next year, all major European automakers groups will have a local Chinese partner that are, that they were relying on for their EV architecture. So. With that, you know, I would say that most of them, especially the Germans, I think they'll remain in the Chinese market. I don't think they'll build on their market share, but I think they will have a place because their their brand recognition is still very strong in China. The Got Japanese it. ones, I would say that anyone outside of Toyota, the rest of them are all leaving very soon. Leaving China. Yes. Okay. Uh, Honda is in a lot of trouble. Little background for the listeners. So if you're not a car guy, Stellantis is a multinational that owns Fiat, Chrysler, and some French brands like Citroen, Opel, and a, ma a major automaker. And they, as, as TP was just telling us, they've taken a significant stake in one of the main competitors in the Chinese market. Yeah, it's huge news, I think. If I was actually a politician who wants to be serious about dealing with China tech and China's threat, I would see that as a very interesting development. Right. So the, my, my personal opinion is the U.S. government is going to block Chinese penetration of Chinese cars and EVs into the U.S. market. And they're probably leaning, well, they are leaning on the Europeans to do the same. 
But the fact that a company like Stellantis is, you know, they and Volkswagen and others, they, they want to continue being successful in the Chinese market suggests that they're not going to be able to, or they're going to push their politicians to, to keep their market at least partially open to imported Chinese vehicles. Yeah. So I think with that, the problem with facing the, the Europeans is this, uh, regardless of whether the Chinese automakers are coming in or not, Tesla is already in their market. So they need something that can compete with Tesla locally. If you're able to, even if you're able to completely block the Chinese, you still have to deal with Tesla. So the, so the problem with that is then you need to actually catch up to Tesla in terms of not just the EV cost of things, but also the smart car features. And right now all the smart car development is going on in China. So this is why I say like, you, you can't use, I guess you can try, but you really long-term, you cannot block progress in technology and the, the world as a whole is moving toward using more smart product, more electric based product. You know, when I first came to New York city, this was in 2006, everyone was using a Blackberry, everyone. And then with, within a year, iPhone came to the market and you know, Blackberry died in a few years, right? So you, the, the legacy automakers are Blackberry right now. So if they don't adopt, they don't try to use the latest technology, they're going to suffer the fate of Blackberry. So let me, let, let's come back to that in a second, because the, the smart aspect of the car, I think is super important. But before we do that, let's, let's finish up with the electrical as the electric power aspect of the car. So is it true the most important, the most expensive component, at least in the drivetrain or whatever part of this car is the batteries, correct? And, and that industry is heavily dominated by, I guess, Chinese and maybe Korean manufacturers. Am I correct? Yeah. So, so I think that maybe two years ago, it was probably a parity level between, you know, CATL or cattle and BYD and LG and Panasonic in the motor battery industry. And then as time went on, I think the, the, the Chinese competition and investment in the area allowed the Chinese players to overtake the Koreans and the Japanese in the market share. So now you're basically seeing that the Koreans have disappeared from the Chinese market completely. And uh, yeah, the Chinese battery makers taking over. And the one of the interesting thing part of this is how they've been able to cut down on the cost of batteries. So maybe back in 2020, we would have seen, you know, battery costs are just super expensive, but then over time, they really improved on the battery chemistry. So we're no longer using these very expensive stuff like cobalt and nickel in our batteries. They're using a lot of the cars in China and around the world now are using what they call the LFP technology. So lithium iron phosphate. So we still use lithium, but so, you know, we use more iron phosphate, you know, and obviously there's different chemistries around, but they're, they're trying to lower the cost as much as possible. And going forward, there's a lot of development right now on sodium ion batteries. And the goal of sodium ion battery is just to get, get it cheap enough, but dense enough that you can use it in energy storage systems and also mini cars. And then you can leave the, you know, the more expensive cars to using the lithium chemistries when it comes to batteries. So what, what this has happened is basically cut the battery cost down to a point where it's no longer the most expensive portion of the cars, you know, it is you know, still costly for depending on the type of list, uh, battery you use. But if you use LFP or sodium in the future, it's going to be a, a much smaller portion of your cost. And that's how we're, we're able to see all these bitty cars in, uh, that are dominating the sub 100K RMB range in China right now. Right. So just to recapitulate that. So there's been a lot of innovation in the chemistry and also even the physical design of these batteries to uh, make them more efficient. And it's happened very rapidly. I, I would actually point to that as an example of places where Chinese companies actually can integrate, uh, innovate extremely well, because I think most of that innovation is due to Chinese companies. And at the end, 
when we come back to the overall you know, power grid and energy storage, which is necessary for solar, the point you made, which is that the, the least expensive kind of battery right now is sodium-based. It doesn't have quite the energy density of the lithium variants, but it's enormously cheaper. And you don't need the density for power grid storage applications because obviously it's not, it's something you move around on a vehicle. It's something you attach to your grid and you can use it for power, for load shifting. That is a very important breakthrough, the, the low cost sodium batteries, which I, I think, uh, you know, will affect our ability to use solar power in the grid. Tough, Dolly. So... You mentioned, so probably some listeners are pulling their hair out wondering why did TP say Tesla is in trouble in China? Because there are probably some people very concerned, like they own some shares in Tesla and they, they want you to elaborate on why you said. Yeah. So this is actually not a, is this, this would be a controversial position to, I guess, our Western viewers. But if you're in China, this is actually a commonly held belief at the moment. And it's actually seen, the data actually shows it because there's a couple of things going on right now. There are, when Tesla came in, it had um, a major advantage in terms of technology because it was bringing in a hyper efficient electric train. It was able to build the cars at a cheaper cost than most uh, Chinese competitors, except for BYD. BYD is its own story. So we'll, we can talk about that later. And in terms of smart car features and autonomous driving, it was leading, it was definitely the market leader. And also it had the coolness and brand factor to it. But, you know, if you ever driven, you never sat inside of a Tesla Model Y, like, you know, the one I have, you realize the build quality is not what you consider a luxury car. It's just, it's the, the handling is really nice, but you don't think you're, you're driving a luxurious car when you're sitting in Model Y. And then... Over time, what's hap what has happened in the past couple of years is that Tesla's number one flaw has shown up, which is they just don't have enough uh, model types for the Chinese market. Uh, they have Model 3 and Model Y for the mass market, whereas the Chinese market, the one, the one funny thing about the Chinese automakers, is they love to launch like 10, 20 different models for different segments of the market. And because the Chinese market is so large, that there is demand for all these different type of vehicles. So because Tesla only has basically two models, it could never capture a certain segment of the market. It could never ca capture the, the mini car market, for example, and it could never catch the, 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 the you know, what, what they call the milk dads in China, which are people who are looking for these, it's basically, you know, family cars, huge family cars are looking for China and these off-road vehicles and just, Model Y just can't do that. So because of that, Tesla itself is facing a shrinking pool, a, a smaller pool of potential buyers. And what has happened in the past couple of years is everyone in China is trying to build their own Model 3 and Model Y. So the, so the competition in the market is, has really gone up. And in terms of product quality, Musk has been very specific about his desire to lower the cost of production of cars. And you, so you, you see him doing certain things to the, to the Tesla models, which like, for example, no LIDARs, for example, and rely only on cameras when it comes to sensors for your, for your Tesla Model Y. And also in terms of electric motor, he talked about reducing the usage of silicon carbide, things like that. And because he hasn't been pushing things into a, pushing things hard in technology point of view for Model 3 and Model Y, the, the Chinese competitors have caught up to the, to the technology standard of Tesla. And uh, so now that he has to compete against all these competitors who, a lot of them, I would say they're probably not getting great margins aside from uh, BYD. And, but they're, they're really looking to get a space of this market. So with this increased pressure, and competition in this market, you're seeing that Tesla has to keep cutting prices to generate sales. And it needs to keep on generating sales so that it can ramp up uh, production as this Shanghai Gigafactory. And this Shanghai Gigafactory is by far the lowest, the, the factory that can produce its 
EV is the, the cheapest. So I think people who are following this would all admit that definitely Tesla is in for a difficult fight in China. And not, but obviously there's some disagreement, right, about whether Tesla can still win out and just how good the Chinese competition is. For, for that subset of my listeners that really are just 100% America-based and don't believe any information coming from China, you know, you really just need to go online and look at reviews of, say, BYD cars, you know, maybe by Europeans or Australians or even Israelis and comparing the quality of those cars to Tesla's and, and such. And you, you can see that, you know, I'm not an expert in this area, but I've watched some of these videos and you can see there's some kind of parity now. It's a very competitive situation. And it looks like Tesla is going to be under significant pressure from its competition in China. Yeah, so I, th I think part of the thing is that the Chinese market right now, the crazy thing about the market itself is just moving so quickly that unless you're actually on the ground and looking at it, you really can't just see how things are moving. And these are the conversations that, these are the things that Tesla, China people probably realize. And uh, I'm not sure if, I'm sure they've gotten the message across the must, but I'm not sure they, they, they figured out what they want to do with the with the current situation yet because they still derive a, a pretty large chunk of their sales from China at the moment. And in terms of production costs, it's because the supply chain in China for EV industry is fully built and fully scaled. It's you can't really compare uh, it to any other of their gigafactory in terms of construction costs and things like that. So. Before we get into the sensors and the brain and the AI in these cars and in other cars as well, not even non electric cars, is there anything we want to say you want to say that's specific to the, you know, the electrical aspect, the drivetrain, the battery technology, and anything you want to say about that before we leave the topic? Yeah. So one thing I always wanted to that, that, that I realized recently, and I think it's kind of important to think about is a lot of people look at EVs in general as maybe it's something that, you know, the environmentalists are pushing us toward and, and that that's why we're going in that direction. I, I, I just want to emphasize that I, I generally see EVs versus internal combustion engine cars right now as electrical versus mechanical, because in terms of EVs itself, it's it, the entire motor to drive train itself, the, 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 all the chip technology and the infotainment system, it, everything uses electrical component, whereas your typical internal combustion engine cars, it's, you know, it's, it's a mechanical system. And just because of that, in terms of rea system reaction times and safety and things like that, the, the EV itself, what, regardless of whether it's a plug-in hybrid or a a pure battery electric vehicle, it, the, the system reaction is just faster and the computation inside the EV is faster. So you can react faster to safety situation and there's, there's more sensors to it. It's, it's all connected by wire, right? So it can just, the system can just react faster. So you see that in terms of safety, all these EVs are coming out, they're getting tested. Like some, you know, aside from Tesla, all these Chinese EVs are getting tested in Europe right now. They're all getting five star on the end cap because in terms of advanced safety features, they're all really good compared to internal combustion engine cars. And the way I look at it is in the history, when, when the electrical system and the mechanical system has about the same cost, I, I don't think the mechanical system is going to win against electrical system. Yeah. I mean, you know, when, when people look back, like your kids grow up and they've only driven an electric car. They look back, they'll be amazed when you tell them, yeah, there were these little cylinders and we had an explosion in each cylinder. And that's actually what caused a piston to move. And that, you know, drove the drive shaft and powered your car. They'll say like, what a crazy way to do it. Like, I can't believe that, you know, you had to, what a, what a, you know, how, just think how much engineering was required to get all that stuff working. Right. Whereas electric engine with a battery is just so straightforward the way it works. Yeah, there's also a lot less parts to it. It's just basically, it's, it's a lot simpler. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of amazing we actually got internal combustion engines working as well as we did, right? It's kind of like amazing <laughs> yeah. 
amazing technology, but uh, maybe past its prime now. Yeah, I think I think that's what the people are thinking in China. That's why they are most people most people are moving on to EVs now. Great. So let's let's talk about the brain in the car and the sensors. So, you know, obviously people heard a lot, you know, five years ago about autonomy, self-driving cars. And I think a lot of people have, uh, it, maybe it's traveled the usual Silicon Valley hype cycle where initially people got super excited and started extrapolating like crazy what the world would be like with autonomous vehicles. Then it turned out to be a slightly harder engineering problem than people thought, and there wasn't as much progress and fortunes were lost. And now people are kind of have kind of forgotten a little bit about autonomy, but slowly but surely it's creeping into the world. So maybe you can talk about the state of autonomous vehicles in China and the sensors that they use. Yeah. So in terms of smart cars, I'm talking about, there's, there's, there's several components we're talking about here. There's a smart cockpit and there's a smart energy management. And there's also the, what we call ADAS, which I mean, which means the assistive driving automotive driving assistance system, something about that. So basically the, the autonomous driving features, what we've noticed in the Chinese market is that EVs have traveled this, this in the direction of consumer electronic industry. So there's a pretty uh, famous case of the company Geely, and they actually bought a smartphone company called Meizu. And at the time I thought it was a crazy thing. Why are you trying to get in the phone industry if you're an automaker, right? And it turned out based on what one of the Geely was playing to me is that they were doing it because they wanted to learn as an automaker how to integrate smart car features into their cars. So. In terms of, just in terms of what we call the smart cockpit features, you have your, basically your electrical controls. So if you have displays like a sound system, you have your infotainment screens, you have your, your HUD, your head ups display, and you have various controls. And then you have your, what they call the, you know, in the SOCs, the system on chips on top of that. And then you have your auto OS on top of that. So yeah, you could have your, for different cars, you can have different operating systems sitting on top of your, your, your heartbreak computation layers. And then on top of that, you have your different app systems like Apple CarPlay or Google CarPlay, something like that. And then on top of that, you have all the different apps that you can use to run your system. And what you've noticed in the Chinese market recently is all these smartphones OEMs are looking to somehow get themselves involved in the car industry. So Huawei was like the, the pioneer in this industry. It developed its uh, Harmony OS that works through not just your phone, your, the computer, but also cars and other devices. So when you, as soon as you get into your Huawei car, if you have a Huawei phone, it's actually can control the, the car itself. There's, you know, you can use that to control other Huawei devices at your home and such. The, the next one that's really gotten into this is Xiaomi. And Xiaomi is actually just came out recently with this new OS, which is a Linux based OS called hyper OS. And their goal is to basically combine uh, your mobile endpoint with, with cars, with a smart home so that your car runs just like another consumer electronics device or Xiaomi. That's, that's how Xiaomi thinks about things. And, and it's coming out with its own car based on that concept. So in terms of your car, it's just another place, another thing you have in your personal possession that can be used to control your home, control, deliver entertainment to you and do tasks. And it can be used to answer questions. Like if you have, if you want to talk to chat GPT, for example, you can just ask your car and it can answer you. And that's kind of like uh, what the role of a smart car is playing in terms of the uh, automotive industry in China, where it's, it's no longer just a transportation object. It's something that people use to enjoy different entertainments and things like that. 
Is it clear whether BYD will develop its own operating system for its car, smart car, or will it partner with a company like Huawei? It has its own OS, actually. They, they all use some form of real-time OS. I'm not really sure. All the, all the major automakers in China have their own OS. It might be some kind of a copy of something else, but, you know, similar in concept. In terms of BYD cars, you see that it's, it's got itself, you know, working. Its OS works with like the Huawei High Car and also Apple, Car, Apple CarPlay and probably the Google CarPlay also. Yeah, you know, before I was really thinking about EVs becoming important, I used to say, you know, internal combustion engines, it's kind of a commodity now. I don't see a lot of difference in, you know, at least the, the low end cars that I would consider buying. I don't could see that much difference in the powertrain and stuff like that. So the differentiation will be in the, you know, infotainment system and the smart car aspects of it. And the legacy automakers, I think, don't really understand that that's more obviously more of a software and information technology industry. And there's no evidence that they really understand how to do it right. Yeah. So I kind of want to talk about that too, because there's some really interesting news came out this week, which is Volkswagen decided to fire 2,000 or at least it wants to fire 2,000 more people from its software company called Carriad. And, and if you go to China right now, one of the main topic is, is BYD in trouble because it doesn't do software as well as uh, Huawei? That, that's, a, you, you know, it's kind of crazy to think about that, but that's kind of conversation people are actually having. And by the way, I don't think it's in trouble, but it's people, people you know, looking at the different cars are coming out of China right now. They're seeing how much software plays, how much of a real software plays in terms of the success of cars and the integration of different components. And, and you kind of need that because without, without a firm software engineering culture around, which is the case with a lot of the legacy automakers, you will struggle to do the software hardware integration of getting all these infotainment system and also this uh, autonomous driving features into your cars. And if you think about it, in terms of, in terms of if you want to do autonomous driving features, you have different sensors, you have different cameras, you have different millimeter wave radars, you have also LIDAR, and they're all bringing in a lot of computation data into your, your, into your platform. And with this, you have to use uh, a really highly powerful computation chip. Uh, a lot of people use uh, NVIDIA or an X at the moment. Uh, and, and then I uh, use this data to, uh, to figure out where to turn next and whether to accelerate or stop, things like that. And then you have to also do your own big data center where you're training models against, you know, driving data and try to figure out a, a large model that or algo that works for your autonomous driving features. So all this stuff takes software developers, AI developers, and things like that. And these are things that Germans, I don't want to offend Germans, but they don't have a software industry. And then like, you know, you, you know, if you, if you, if you look at how the world software industry has developed, and it's basically dominated in the Western countries by, you know, the big American tech companies. Yeah, I think it's been said that in the world right now, the only two countries that really can do world-class software engineering is obviously the United States with its big tech companies and then the Chinese with their big tech companies. And I agree with you, it's been observed that there isn't really, although individual Germans are obviously extremely well-trained and, and talented, there isn't, they don't really have the corporate infrastructure to really take on a task like this. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not saying the Germans or the any of the European can't program, but rather that the, the, even the European industry itself is probably most people when they grow up and they're software developer, they probably want to go join Google or Facebook or, or Apple rather than Volkswagen. Yeah. So I think what you pointed out is that there's going to be a lot of computation on the car because you, you're not going to want to do it in the cloud because for safety reasons, you're going to want to do it as fast as you can in the car. You're going to have to deal with lots of data fusion from pretty complicated sensor data. And then the actual 
AI code or the autonomy code that the car is running, wh whatever company provides that is going to be doing tons of offline training in giant data centers to have an actually smart, you know, AI that makes the right decisions in piloting the car. So it becomes yeah. like a super intense, sorry, information technology uh, problem. Yeah, and I just want to point out, I think that's what Tesla has been planning all along, which is they have their own huge data center. And in terms of the cars, one of the things that apparently drove them toward eliminating LIDARs was they wanted to reduce the amount of data clutters. So they, they, they don't really have LIDARs on their car. And I think they're trying to rely purely on cameras. And because you don't have to do as much sensor fusion in terms of uh, figuring out what the picture looks like. Right. So I think you and I talked about this, or maybe Taylor Ogan and I talked about this. The, okay. So LIDAR is a laser uh, sensing technology, which used to be quite expensive, but the cost has dropped tremendously, again, thanks to innovation on the Chinese side, to the point where it's quite inexpensive to get it as an option on your Chinese car if you're buying a car in China. Elon Musk famously sort of said at one point, oh, I, I drive my car fine or humans drive their cars fine with just visual input data, like, you know, visual, uh, you know, visible light. Why do we need lasers and radars? <laughs> this, and obviously right. at the time, it was too expensive anyway to put on a consumer vehicle. So I think Tesla's push toward autonomy is, has always been based on, you know, actually just the visual input. But the academic researchers that I know and lots of other companies that are really trying hard to build autonomous vehicles, they'll take all the input they can get because they know it's a hard problem. And LIDAR is a super useful type of input into, you know, it, allowing your vehicle to be aware of what's around it. Yeah. So I, I just want to address the, something about the, the, the cost side of things is that I think if you don't, this is one thing where, where I think it's very important for people to go inside China and a look at what's going on because I don't live inside China clearly. And I see this, I see these things happening from abroad because if you just look at the news coming out of China in terms of from maybe a year ago, in terms of how they're building up or two years ago from how much BYD is scaling up its uh, various uh, battery components and then battery factory production to uh, how it's raising its production of uh, um, power chips, then you knew back then that it, the battery prices are coming down. Then you also know that the, the uh, power chip prices are coming down. And what we're seeing right now is even though the, the LiDAR prices have come down a lot already and adoption has, I think for her side, it's one of the you know, leaders for supplying LiDARs in China. It's deliveries 10X from last year to this year, but it's gonna get a lot cheaper because I'm looking at right now at the Chinese market where the the core component is what they call with what's called a VCSEL, V C S E L. I I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but I'm seeing that the production right now for 2025 is so much higher than what is right now. So we're gonna see an overcapacity or at least enough capacity to keep up with any kind of demand that we have in a couple of years which means that the cost for LIDARs is going to come down tremendously. The cost for uh, millimeter wave radars are going to come down significantly also. And the resolution on the millimeter wave radar is going to get good enough where we might not need LIDARs for, for level three or level four driving. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see how this plays out. But that's what a lot of people in China are trying to just figure out right now. Can we do full L3 or level three or level four autonomous driving with the lowest cost possible. And, and what is the amount of computation we actually need for that? And we don't want to use any more than that because we want to keep the, the cost of the system under 10,000 RMB, for example. Right, so again, another aspect of the automobile industry, in this case, autonomy and the sensors, which is changing super fast and actually you know, large part of that change, or maybe most of it, is actually driven by what's happening in China now. So again, like I think most Westerners could easily miss miss this if they're not paying close attention. Yes, and I think that if you're not into Chinese EVs, 
even if you're just looking at what DJI drones are have came out recently with their electro optical lidar system, and it's and the performance is it's showing it it's better than anything the Russians are using on the battlefield. Let's put it that way. So the, the technology for this is just improving so quickly, and the cost is coming down so much. It, it's fun. It's so funny because TP the, the 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 next episode you and I do together is going to be about miltech Chinese versus you know Western military technology, and just looking at what's happening on the civilian side with these sensors, it's hard to believe that the drones and missile systems and satellite systems that the Chinese have are actually behind you know the Western side when it comes to the sensors because it's pretty clear to me that. The Chinese are pretty much caught up and in some areas surpassed the Western technology for a lot of the for a lot of sensors relevant to military technology. Yeah, it's it's kind of crazy. And I think it's been a very recent, um, very recent thing. And I'm not sure that the Chinese military, you know, all the military contractors, they're always behind in terms of tech. So I'm not sure they actually caught up on the, the technology. But I have seen some uh, um, autonomous, uh, what they call the UGVs or unmanned ground attack vehicles in China recently that are using the same technology you would see on the, um, on, on your level three, or level four ADAS system. Yeah. I think for example, where I first noticed this was the Chinese were putting actively electronically scanned radar systems in their missiles, long range missiles. So the missile could actually be very autonomous near the end of you know, you know, it might fly several hundred kilometers looking for the enemy fighter or, or bomber. And then at the end, it's fully capable of finding it and using its own sensors for final targeting. And that that was done, I think, before the Western systems had a AESA radars uh, on their on their missiles. So, so you could see the Chinese were actually sort of getting ahead in certain areas. Yeah. And it's all about just industrializing, scaling up production. I mean, ASA radars got so cheap in China now that they, they put them on weather radars. Yeah, the weather radars are using gall gallium nitrate ASA radars now. It's, it's yeah. so crazily. Where, whereas I think still very few of the Western missiles actually have their own ASA radars. They're often dependent on the ASA radar of the, the, fi the plane that launched the missile. Yeah, I mean, I think it's only the, AI, the upcoming AIM-260 that will be using. Yeah, uh, see, I think you... ASA. I think you noticed the same thing I noticed. So, so anyway, this this is for our next conversation. But there are some little indicators like this that suggest this, you know, commercial rapid pace of commercial advancement of Chinese technology is is also you know getting into their military supply chain as well. Coming back to cars, okay, I have a very simple question for you: How do I invest in BYD? Like, what it's listed in in China or in Hong Kong? So I'm actually personally invested in BYD from the, as it's an OTC symbol. I think it's BYDDF or BYDDY. Let me just do a search on that. But it's basically, I think, an ADR of the, the one in Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Okay. We could have a whole nother discussion of exactly what the legal rights of these US, you know, Western listed ADRs of Chinese companies are. That's a, that's a tricky question that I sometimes discuss with my friends in finance. Because I think in certain circumstances, it doesn't quite have the same rights as actually owning a share of, of BYD or something. So, No, I think it's probably you owning some shares of some place in Caymans or something like that. Yeah, which, which then that thing, that entity is entitled to some share of profits or it, it's very tricky how, you know, how, exactly how one should value these things. But anyway, they're okay. So I don't even have to go to the Hong Kong exchange. I could just buy these, these OTC listed things from my ordinary broker, I guess. Yeah. I actually, I brought it on Schwab. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Now we're a little over an hour and I, I did want to shift over eventually to the implications for, of cheap battery storage to, you know, the overall power grid and things like this. But before we do that, Maybe let's finish up if there are any important aspects of the, you know, the EV industry, how you think it's going to progress in China, how you think it's going to progress outside of China, how geopolitics is going to affect it. Anything that you want to add before we leave that topic would be great. Yeah. So I think, I think the, the one company, you know, I, I've been following and I want to always talk about is BYD because it's really an extraordinary company in its own way. 
And I think it's going to change the, the company itself is going to change the world in many ways. But the one thing, if you listen to Wang Chenfu, the, the CEO, talk, the founder CEO talk about is he's very precinct in understanding uh, why he's, you know, building BYD and the demand for, for, for electric vehicles and his entire business model and things like that. So, so if, if we go back to like why, you know, people originally want, you know, the environmental reasons where people wanted to get EVs. And there's always this discussion, you know, when it comes to climate change and energy transition, you know, wh why should we do it? Well, you know, China is not doing it. And one of the things I, I really want to point people out to is that China and America are two different countries with two different strengths and weaknesses. Like different countries have different advantages and, and disadvantages, right? So one obvious thing is America has this great, you know, depending on how you look at it, but it has a really large natural gas reserve. It has this great fracking industry that generates a lot of profits. It, it, we get a lot of cheap gas here. Whereas China does not have much of a um, oil industry, like it doesn't produce as much oil, like it's not its largest importer in the world. And it also imports a lot of natural gas from Russia, from surrounding Central Asian countries, and it buys from America, LNG from America and Australia and various countries. So it's a major energy importer. And this has always been viewed as a huge problem in China. And part of the reason that Wang Chenfu thought about this is that he, he looks at this as how do we get China to be energy independent? How do we get China to be energy secure? And what does China have more than anything else? It has a lot of desert. It has huge amount of deserts. So his view is if we can put a, a, a whole bunch of like solar panels around China, then we can be energy independent. And because Solar panels themselves has, are very intermittent in terms of power storage and things like that. We need energy storage system and we need smart grids to handle that. And that's why I'm going to invest in building my own solar panel industry. I'm going to invite, build my energy storage system. I'm going to build my smart grid and we need smart, we need EVs so we don't have to import as much oil to be energy secure. And that's. And he's doing this not just for the uh, passenger vehicles. He's also spent a lot of a lot of money investing in mass transit. So he has his own skyrail that he uses that it's entirely battery powered uh, that can carry a lot of people. He has this bus division, trucking division, forklift, different kind of commercial vehicles, and he's also trying to supply that to other commercial vehicle companies. So his his entire model is not just EVs. So BYD's entire model is not just EVs. But how do we perform the entire energy transition for China? And then since we have this now for China, now we can go to other countries and say to them, okay, we can help you do energy transition. Do you want my help or not? And so what happened in April is that when Lula visited, so President Lula of Brazil visited China, he didn't really want to talk to Xi. He wanted to go to BYD and talk to BYD. So it was very important for him to go to BYD and get BYD to build an EV and a new energy industry inside Brazil. So Brazil, so BYD was already building like commercial vehicles and solar panels in, in Brazil. And after Lula's, Lula's visit, BYD said, okay, we'll agree to expand our presence in Brazil. We will build batteries in your country. We will build cars in your country. We will build trucks in your country or buses in our country. And now Brazil has something that can carry in terms of manufacturing in the, in the next couple of decades. And, you know, those are the geopolitical influences that a company like BYD has. And, you know, when Gavin Newsom came to China recently, he went to the BYD headquarter and he's not the only one, like all the major leaders, when they come to China, they go to BYD headquarter in Shenzhen now. You know, I, that was an amazing summary. I, I think BYD, I agree with you. It's one of the most amazing companies in the world today. I mean, in a way, like maybe more amazing than uh, Elon's, uh, you know, portfolio, although obviously his, his portfolio is pretty impressive 
But, you know, those different components you talked about. So first of all, just in the last few years, EVs have gotten to the point where in terms of cost, practicality, you know, the desire of people to own them, it's basically we've passed this tipping point now where most people could, you know, maybe not in America, but in, in a lot of countries could switch to EV mobility. And that just wasn't true even a few years ago, right? Yeah, so, I, I think okay. also back in the, one thing that Tesla was able to do that few other companies was, was able to do until BYD was just scale EVs. You see that Ford and GM recently canceled their EV plants. It's not easy to scale your EV production, but you know Tesla was able was probably the first to, to do so. And then after Tesla, BYD basically figured out the entire supply chain and how to scale up the EV supply chain and how to increase the production and get the cost way down. And that's going to have a huge impact on how the rest of the world buy things. So in Asia now, you can see that BYD cars are coming to these markets in Southeast Asia that are typically, that was previously completely dominated by Toyota and Honda. And now you see BYD with maybe 70% market share in Thailand or other countries and in terms of EVs. And, and the EV you know, market share is just climbing. They're probably like two years behind China right now, but you can see that if, if China gets to like maybe 70% EV penetration in 2027, 2028, maybe these other countries will get to that in 2030. But it's, it's still like a, a huge change in how people buy vehicles in the, a lot of countries. Yeah, with, the, with the, the, the price range and the, you know, the range of distance you can travel on a charge and the recharging characteristic people could switch over without a lot of convenience loss, even if they were in a, comp a country that didn't invest a lot in the charging infrastructure. It, it's not that bad, right? You could, you could survive with a car that has, you know, 300 or 700 kilometer range on a charge. Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of these countries, people are not looking to travel much further. You know, they're, they're not doing like uh, 200 mile road trips. Yeah, exactly. Back and forth. So, so the mobility part, I mean, if you take a step back and you put on your environmentalist, you know, trying to, you know, limit the carbon in the atmosphere, uh, if you put on that hat, you realize, wow, things are kind of coming together because the major source of energy consumption, i.e. mobility, there is a potentially practical way to do that now in a carbon-free way. And then on the other side of things, the really impressive thing to me is that solar panel efficiencies have gotten to the point where when the sun is shining, the cost per joule of energy is really the lowest from solar panels. So, so it really is potentially the best form of energy. And the problem is intermittency. But intermittency is going to be solved by you know, better battery technology. And so now that we have these inexpensive sodium batteries, I haven't run the numbers on this, maybe you have, but it seems like it makes a lot of sense now, or it will soon for power companies to basically really go all in on solar and then use these sodium-based batteries as a way to load balance so that you know when the sun goes down, you don't have to fire up your, your gas power plant. You can, you can draw from batteries eventually. Now, maybe we're not quite there in terms of cost and effectiveness of the batteries, but you could see that it's, it's a possible future that we can get to. Yeah, like BYD recently said their goal is to get the cost of solar, I'm sorry, sodium ion battery to at the same level as pumped hydro, which I don't know if they'll, they'll get to that level as pumped hydro, but I think if they can get something close to that, that will be, that will make things very affordable to, to most grids and operator. Obviously, you're still going to have issues like in the winter time, you're just going to get a lot less sun than summertime. So then... I think some of that will have to be offset um, by, you know, hydrogen, green hydrogen production. And, you know, obviously offshore wind is a, is a great form of renewable. And obviously nuclear plays a huge part in, part in this equation also. But, you know, in order to balance out the grids, there's going to be a huge market out there for energy storage systems and smart grids in general. And every word you see in China, they're talking about 
oh, we have the latest and most efficient energy storage system. It's all smart. And I can never figure out how smart she can get really. So I guess we'll have to see because for a lot of people, energy storage system is just a box around a battery pack. Yeah, I'm not sure what the smart part means, but definitely you can see that if, if you can drive down the storage costs enough, that it really changes entirely the, you know, the equation in terms of how much solar you can use in your system. Yeah, and I think also in terms of a lot of the technology involved in lowering the cost of energy storage system also applies to EVs and grids in general because it's involved in control chips, lowering cost of product producing control chips, and more, most importantly, silicon carbide and just power chips in general. How do you produce the most efficient power chips that are silicon based or silicon carbide based or maybe gallium nitrate based that are just more efficient and have the least amount of energy loss. And those are kind of the important portion to think about. There's, as I mentioned, I think you and I were discussing, I guess before in our previous podcast, we were discussing this in the context of, what was it? Oh, I think it was analog chips that are used in modems and phones. You know, there's a lot of basic double E stuff, like how to do like efficient power transmission over vast distances or the, the chips that you were just describing, those are all things which are not at all glamorous in the West and, and not that much attention gets paid to these things. But you can tell in China, they're working really hard on this stuff. And, and I think they're going to end up dominating a lot of these industries. Yeah. And I, I think that's, uh, I think Western politicians are going to wake up one day and realize what happened to our silicon carbide or our power chip industry, why is it all in China? Because this is something that Western companies like Infineon, Wolfspeed have really dominated for, for years and they had a huge head start against the, their Chinese competitors. But then because there was a huge demand inside China and there's a lot of Chinese customers and they're all talking about, we need to de-risk, we need de-risk from, from possibly Americans cutting us off. So then, so then these companies like, okay, well, well we need to source stuff from China, we, or we need to do JVs with China to get into the China market, or we need to buy silicon carbide wafers or substrate from China. So then, so then you can see in China market right now, is there's this huge ramp up in these power chip production, which is just mind blowing. And, and it's, it's, it's hard to imagine for me, we don't get a situation in three or four years time where Chinese producers aren't producing maybe half the silicon carbide chips out there. Basically, yeah. In, in these areas that we're discussing, I, I just don't see a bottleneck. Like in the case of EUV, going coming back to the chip war, you can imagine. Oh, that could be pretty hard to get working efficiently. There could be a little bottleneck there. It took ASML and U.S. researchers really twenty years to get that working. So you could imagine there there could be a bottle potentially a bottleneck there in fabrication. But for making better power chips and stuff like that, I just think the Chinese are, you know, if they realize they have to do it, they're going to do it and they're going to catch up, you know, in, in a few years probably. So I really think Jake Sullivan and, you know, U.S. chip sanction strategy is going to turn out to be one of the, I don't think people will notice this because people don't really pay attention enough. But a historian that went back and looked at it carefully would say this was like a huge mistake uh, by American policymakers. Uh, yes. I've, I've often said that certain people build statues after Biden and certain politicians in America in China. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they, they picked absolutely, in a way, like one of the worst areas to put the fear of God into China, like, like to make them afraid that they could be cut off on something, but that something turns out to be an area where they're really good at catching up. That, that's, like, that's like a mistake, a big mistake. So, all right. Any last comments you want to make on mobility, electric vehicles, autonomy? Yeah. So I think this is a very interesting industry. And I think what happens in China is very important to the rest of the world in terms of just the changing landscape of manufacturing, the changing geopolitical landscapes, what happens if China has all the latest technology and uh, in terms of uh, automotive industry. But what happens in China if it figures out how to integrate different, you know, 
devices all into the same operating system. What happens in China if they figure out how to get, you know, your AI, a large language models in your, in your smart cockpit working that can control rest of your, control your home and completely change your lives because countries around the world, uh, our people around the world are going to want that technology. It's not something where sanctions can hold, like protectionism can hold that back. So at a certain point, countries are, are going to say, okay, we're just going to uh, want the best and the latest from China rather than, you know, America. And that's going to be a problem for certain people. And also we've, we've noticed from this past week was the GM and Ford announcement. And also with, if you just look at the Rivian production numbers, it, the, the EV supply chain in America is not ready to fully scale up, in my opinion, at least. It hasn't shown the ability to show us to like really ramp up yet. And because of that, if you want to get the latest technology, if you want to know, be able to get cheap, affordable EV technology, you have to go to China right now. And politicians keep thinking that the reason why China has this advantage in batteries is because of central planning and things like that. While central planning did help in help setting the policies, end of the day, it was the, t the companies themselves like BYD and Huawei and others, or the auto that actually did the hard work. And because there were so much competitions that they drove each other to innovate, to deliver the best product for the, for the customers. And they, and they also have the, you know, the widest base of supply chain and local talent in terms of developing new, uh, you know, AV industry, which have applications that go beyond cars. So this will have, you know, effect because in the end of the day, we're going to see in the future when all the European cars, I don't know if this will actually happen, but all the European cars will not only have batteries that are made by Chinese battery makers, but also their electric drive are based on technology from their Chinese partners and their smart cockpit technology are based on their Chinese partners and their autonomous vehicle driving uh, is developed with the help from uh, the ADAS, you know, software company, a startup or something in China. And I don't know how the, the politicians will handle that, but that, that is, you know, kind of where I see the future is based on what I've seen the last couple of months. And, and I think the well, Stellantis uh, leap motor deal is kind of like the, the fuck, one of the more recent nail on the coffin for me and just, you know, just like formalizing this, this, this situation. And unfortunately our media is terrible at covering this stuff. They are, they would rather spend all their day trying to figure out what's wrong with China than trying to figure out, okay, what is actually going on in the Chinese tech sector so that our people at home are not misinformed of like, w what are the things that might change our future? Yeah. You know, the biggest disconnect every day in the Western media is between, you know, there's always got to be one doomer story about the Chinese economy in, you know, each of the major, you know, uh, outlets, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, et cetera. So there's always one, at least one doomer story. But then for people who are actually following the technology competition or the, you know, manufacturing capability competition between China and the West, it looks like China is actually winning more than it's losing in almost every category. So there's, there's a, just a huge disconnect. And yeah, it's definitely a disservice to Americans who actually want to know what's actually happening in the world. Definitely. I, th I think it's very important to just keep an eye on it and, and see what's going on, because I think there will be a lot of news that might shock people over the next couple of years coming out of China. Yeah. I think, you know, unless you pay pretty close attention to individual technology sectors, you just wouldn't notice the pattern. But like, just to take an example, in the room that I'm recording this podcast in, I have a big screen TV made by Hisense, and which costs only a few hundred bucks. And I'm old enough to remember a time when flat panel displays were first coming out. You know, all the display technologies were controlled by, you know, Japanese, American companies, maybe Korean companies. And they used to say, oh, the Chinese are making these cheap TVs, but they don't even, th their margins are terrible because they don't really control the display technologies. They're just assembling stuff. But now that situation has totally changed where I think now it's, I think if I'm not mistaken, it's basically just 
the the Koreans and the Chinese that are still in it, battling it out for dominance in display technology. Yeah, and and the uh, the Koreans are slowly getting knocked out of LCD, and uh, and they're even lost their now even OLED. The Chinese producers have a higher market share in Q3 versus Samsung. Yeah, so now if you were a young person and you were just becoming aware of like display technology, you'd be like, oh yeah, I guess the Chinese have always been good at display technologies, but. I'm old enough to remember a time when they were just mocked as just like dumb assemblers, like peasants assembling things with almost no margin for these other companies from other countries that, quote, could really master the technology. But of course, that's all gone now. Like now, now the Chinese actually mastered the technologies. And that's just, if you pay attention, it's happening across just huge range of different technologies and industrial sectors. Yeah, and when one of the Chinese automakers, Cherry, when it first came to America, or it might have been Geely, one of the companies had their car being tested in the Euro NCAP. And it just, it was really a horrifying sight because he got a one star and the car just disintegrated in these frontal crash tests. And now that you look at these Chinese auto, Chinese EVs, like the BYD ones or the Neo cars are getting tested in Euro NCAP, they're all getting five star. So, you know, like the, these things, these things change over time. It could, it changes a lot faster than people think. And, but a lot of these people, they base their knowledge, our polit political class on what they saw 15 years ago when they were coming up. Exactly. So the people, I think in America, people are, you know, really out of date in understanding what the competitive situation is. And the place where that really counts is if our policymakers are overconfident and think we still have cards to play that we really don't have to play, they could miscalculate and, you know, it could end very badly for the whole world. Definitely. All right. Well, TP, this has been another great episode. Of course, I'm still looking forward to our Miltech episode. And I want to thank you again. Everyone should follow TP on Twitter. I believe it's at TP Huang, H-U-A-N-G, on Twitter or on X, I should say. And he is one of the best sources for information about things like China technology, electric vehicles, and uh, semiconductors. So, to... and, and a little bit on apparently on OS, uh, operating system, and AI now because good. I am a I am a software engineer by trade, so a little nerdy in this area. Excellent. All right. Well, I want to thank you again for being on the show. Thank you. <laughs>